okay. Stopped here. We stopped here at the Zimmerman Traxler. So uh, let's jump back in and uh, talk about another method for inducing chirality, which is to use a chiral auxiliary. All right, this, so this would be akin to uh, taking something that's chiral, which is the auxiliary, and something achiral, and then reacting them together to get a chiral product. Um, and so this was kind of pioneered by uh, Dave Evans at Harvard, very, very, he was a phenomenal uh, organic chemist. Um, and uh, so the auxiliary is this chiral oxazolidinone, which is what you see right here, right? And he just attached uh, the carbonyl moiety onto that. And then that is the part where you're for, gonna generate your enolate, right? So you'll be able to, this alpha site right here is where your enolate is gonna come from. And you don't need a chiral Lewis acid. So you just need a Lewis acid to activate uh, the aldehyde. And that's what that's the purpose of the uh, dibutyl boron triflate. So the boron is acting as your Lewis acid. So it's going to activate the aldehyde, lower the LUMO, and so on and so forth. So that's why your reaction is going to happen. Um, and if you, you look at the product with this chiral auxiliary, and with this isopropyl group here, you get the SAM product, right? But you get this uh, stereoisomer. Both, both the methyl group and the hydroxyl group are uh, pointed back. And you can see here, based on your aldehyde, that's why I just have RCHO, because they probe the scope of the reaction, right? Based on your um, aldehyde that you use, Right, you can have up to greater than 500 to one diastereomer ratio, which is awesome. Right, so the, the diastereomer of this would be the anti, where one of these would be uh, wedged and one is dashed. Right, uh, you get a greater than 500 to one sand to anti ratio and good yields, uh, whether you use aliphatic or aromatic. Um, Aldehydes doesn't matter. And then here's another analog of that auxiliary shown here, where you have a, a methyl group here and a phenyl group here. <laughs> and uh, same Lewis acid, dibutyl boron triflate, and then diisopropyl ethylamine as your base. Notice the conditions to zero degrees and then methylene chloride, which is awesome, right? Methylene chloride is. Uh, that's to, that's to form the enolate, which is normally in order to make the enolate, you got to cool everything down. I mean, to like minus 78 to even do that. And normally you do it with like butyl lithium or some other base. Uh, now, when you add the aldehyde, you do have to cool it to minus 78. Because again, lower the lower the temperature, the more selective the reaction is going to be. Uh, at higher temperature, there's more energy. So you got access to more uh, mechanistic pathways. Right, so you you cool it down to minus 78, syringe in your aldehyde, and then let it warm the room temperature. You can see again, greater than 500 to one, sand to anti, uh, and then 88% um, yield and 89% yield in both cases, right? Uh, and so they 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 don't let me let me back up because here is it's indicated that it's uh sand sand so either both uh both wedged or both dashed and then there's no anti so for this auxiliary with the groups going back the uh major isomer has both of the the hydroxyl and the methyl group coming up and then the minor product is will be these two 
on the same face as the groups that are going back here. All right, so no anti, I apologize for that. But it's still a phenomenal reaction and it's been used quite a bit. I actually at Carolina, uh, one of the professors there kind of took a little page out of this and you know made some other analogs of that oxazolidinone and it's good chemistry. It's facile, uh, it's cheap to do. And not only that, you get a lot of uh, high yield and the auxiliary is easy to take off, right? And you can do a lot of different things with it. Right. If you want to convert it to an ester, you can do that. Uh, if you want to convert it to a carboxylic acid, you can do that with lithium uh, peroxide right here. Right. You can use like wine rip salt and you can convert it to the wine ribs amide, which then you can treat with a Grignard or some other nucleophile to make a ketone. Right. So there's a bunch of different <clears throat> functionality that you can build in uh, using this oxazolidone and you can reduce it down, reduce that whole thing down to uh, the alcohol, right? Uh, and that won't, <coughs> all, none of these perturbations will change the stereochemistry of what you've already built up. So the R group right here is whatever you've built, whatever aldol functionality you built up uh, from the aldol addition. And then uh, you can take that, that uh, chiral auxiliary and just do what you want to do with it, right? You can, again, reduce it, sterify it, you can do transamination, or you can hydrolyze it to the uh, carboxylic acid. And that's, in, that's important because, again, when you're doing synthesis, you, if, you, if you are developing a method, the goal is to always take that method and, and apply it to a larger problem like a total synthesis. So everybody, anybody who develops a method, you're always looking long-term at how you can take that method and apply it to something bigger, all right? So we talked about the Mukiyama aldol already. So now let's talk about the asymmetric version of that and, and what type of uh, chiral catalyst is used and so on and so forth. So with the uh, Mukiyama aldol addition, right, you can use the silo enol ether, which we talked about already, or a silo ketene acetal. And the ligand in this case is, do I have that? I don't have it. I'm, I'll, I'll draw, I'll write it in. The ligand is BINAP and the, uh, it, it, with silver triflate. And then you do this in uh, 18 crown six, which is a crown ether. That's, a, that's just a solvent. Uh, let me introduce you to that because I'm not sure you you may have may or may not have seen that. So let me introduce you to that. So the the Bonap ligand, I can't annotate, so I, I just have to pull it up. The Bonap ligand looks like this, right? It is a uh, <laughs> again a C2 symmetric ligand. And you have this, uh, it's, it's like a, how do I put it? It's kind of like a, a, a paddle, right? So you can see right here on this part of it, this is kind of coming out. And then you got this rotational, uh, you can rotate around this sigma bond right here, right? And so this part here is coming out. So that's where your chirality comes from, is that the binap, the, the two naphthalene systems they aren't parallel, they sit at an angle to one another, right? And so here, the phosphorus is what, what's gonna coordinate to your uh, metal. And this, this ligand is classic. I mean, it's been, it, it's used in so many different types of reactions because it's, so, it's such a useful ligand uh, and it gives you great enantioselectivity. selectivity. Um, and so that, and then let me show you this, uh, 18 crown six, so it's just an ether solvent, but it's it's not a typical ether. It's almost like a polymeric version of it. All right, so this is what the crown ether looks like, right? And you can see it's kind of like a, it, you can imagine this, right? Like almost being like a, a, a cage, you know, around your reactants. So this is the 18 crown six. It's got six oxygens here, 
And then uh, the 18, if I'm not mistaken, is the number of uh, missing one, two. Uh, so it's 12 carbons in that ring, but it's 18 atoms total. So that's why they, that's why it's called 18 crown six. All right. Uh, and again, crown ethers are, are pretty useful solvents as well, right? So that's the solvent for that reaction. And let me go back to here. So silver bonap is my catalyst. And then I'm doing this in 18 crown six. Notice the temperature, only, it's all, only at minus 20. And the range of time, reaction times is somewhere between four hours and 24 hours. Right, and then at the end, you see that step, that KF, <clears throat> that step that ha that uses KF, that's just to take off the uh, silo group. Because you can see over here, it's a different silane, it's trimethoxy silane. So you just treat it with KF at the very end to remove that, right? But let's look at the at the reaction scope, right? So this is um, one of your products, right? You can see it's a SIM product. Uh, and the aldehyde is uh, benzaldehyde uh, that was used. And then 24 hours, 51% yield, 99% sand to anti, and then 90% EE, which is very, that's, that's excellent. Uh, you can see here, uh, if you start with uh, cinnamaldehyde as your aldehyde, right? And you, ch and, and you have a cyclic uh, siloenol ether, or, yeah, it's a silo enol ether. Uh, four hours, 68% yield. The selectivity is not that great, but it favors the anti. You can see here where this is, these uh, two groups are anti to one another, 73 to 27, and then 89% EE, uh, which is not shabby. And, and again, the sin and anti part, the diastereomers, you can actually separate those out. Uh, you can, most of the time, you can separate out diastereomers using a column, uh, flash chromatography. Uh, are y'all familiar with that, the flash chromatography method? Anybody? Somewhat. Yeah, uh, let, me, let me see. So I kind of like teaching this way, because you just can hit stuff when you see it. But So this was developed, this is a, we, we didn't really get to this in organic lab, so I'm going to pull it up here. All right, so the, let me pull it up right there. So this is a basic like flash chromatography setup. You have a solvent, now normally this is all together. I don't know, I've never seen one where you could separate the pieces, <clears throat> but a flash column normally looks like this where you have a reservoir for your solvent and then you have a, the column part where you pack it with sand and silica. So sand is at the bottom, silica gel in between, and then sand at the top. Some people do wet packing and some do dry packing. I prefer to do wet packing where I take my silica gel, add my solvent system to it and stir it up, make a slurry out of it, and then pour it into the column. Uh, yeah. it, you, you, have a le you have less chance for having a air bubbles and cracks and things like that because it's very sensitive to that. So once you put the, the uh, silica gel in, you put another layer of sand over top and you just put your uh, material down onto that sand before you fill up that reservoir with solvent. Uh, and the, the, the point is that if you wanna separate out your diastereomers, nine times out of 10, they're gonna have different physical properties. So you can separate them out using flash chromatography. Uh, and, and, and again, it's a method that when I first started teaching here, we used to do uh, columns all the time in organic lab, but then we switched the curriculum. So we, we didn't have time to do it, but you can run a column in a flash column. I've run columns in syringes. If you have a very small amount of material, 
you can even make a make a syringe into a, a flash column. So uh, it just depends on what you need to do and how badly you want to get those compounds purified. But it's, it's mainly a method for purification. All right here's another example right here. So this is a stand. This is what it would normally look like. It's not two pieces. It's just one uh, one piece. Nice column here, and then the width of the column is going to determine. You're going to uh, base the the width that you use is going to be based on how much material you have. You have a, a lot of material you need to purify, and you use a wider column. If you have don't have a whole lot, then you use a thinner column. All right. Uh, let's go back to here. All right. So again, you can you set you can isolate your diastereomers based on physical properties. And antimers you can't separate on a column, right? You can only separate them on a uh, using some type of some other type of chromatic graphic method, but you can't separate them on a flash column. Uh, so yeah, so you can see here, uh, even with a different aldehyde, uh, parabromo benzaldehyde and your and this um, cyclohexanone, 86% yield, 95% EE, and then 92 to eight uh, Santa anti, all right? And, and it's, it's odd because you're not using uh, an ester, right? But you're getting anti products. Same here, right? You're starting with a ketone and you're getting anti products, which is counterintuitive because we talked about the ketone. You can see right even here. Um, I need to be able to annotate this, but you can see even here with the with the ketone. If I make the enolate here, right? I'm tra I'm locked in a. Um, E confirmation here. So you expect that to be anti, but over here, you can see right here, like uh, the sand is the predominant product. And you started out with this as your ketone. So again, you're still using a ketone, but you here you expect to be able to get to that Z confirmation and you expect the sand product to predominate, but here you kind of lock it into the E. And then you get the, you know, the, the uh, expected favorite anti -pro anti product because of that e enolate. But the whole idea is that <clears throat> your ratios are going to be different, and the reason is because <laughs> what's proposed is that there's not a closed transition state. Remember, we talked about the model for aldol chemistry being the Zimmerman Traxler transition state. And it's closed, it's six membered, it's well organized, uh, organized by your Lewis acid. But in this case, what they propose is that your sand anti uh, ratios are not, are not dictated by the geometry of the enolate. So E and Z don't matter. Uh, what matters is how bulky your substituents are. And so you can see right here for this is with this being the E enolate. Uh, reacting that with an aldehyde, this is the proposed transition state. They give it to you in, in, in kind of a Newman projection uh, type confirmation. But the goal, you can see automatically, the goal is to keep R1 and R2 away from one another, right? And, and minimize the steric interaction between R1 and R2. I don't care what reaction you do, it's always going to be controlled by two factors. It's either going to be controlled by steric factors or electronic factors. So in this case, it's a steric effect, right? But you can see here with the Z, uh, with the E enolate here and the Z, right? You get the same product in both cases, right? And you can, if you look right here, you can see, again, you're trying to, you're trying to minimize uh, interaction between these groups right here. And then even with the E enolate, right? You you want to also minimize uh, the interactions as much as possible. But here you do have some steric inter interference between R one and R two uh, with the with the uh, Z enolate, but you still end up with the same product. So the more bulky R one and R two are, that's going to really control how the uh, enolate and the aldehyde approach one another. But but the proposal is that 
you don't get this uh, closed, well-organized transition state. And so that's why you see the, the ratios kind of look kind of funky compared to what you would normally see, right? Because you think about it, if we go back to this example right here, right, this is locked. This, this inhalate in this ring is going to be locked in the E confirmation, but you still see like the ratio between sin and anti is not, you know, all that great. It's not a hundred to one. It's not 500 to one, even though it's locked in the Z confirmation, you know, it's still a decent ratio, 27 to 73. Same thing here. And that was the purpose of the experiment to see uh, what happens if you lock that into the confirmation. And then you can look right here, you see the only time it actually goes up to some noticeable degree is when you use a, a bulky aldehyde because bromine, you know, bromine is huge atomic radius wise. So that's when you see that jump, you know, for anti descent, what you expect with a Z, with a, a E inhalate anyway. Um, but the bulk of that substituent is what controls that. It's not the actual uh, transition state being locked into a, a closed transition state. It actually goes through this open transition state. All right. Any questions about that? And you can see again, if I make R2 uh, bigger in this transition state where I, I, I expect this, since this is Z, I expect it to be sin. If I make R2 bigger, more than likely, uh, this R2 is going to be here, and then the, the hydrogen is going to be here. So it's going to attack from the opposite face of that aldehyde, right? Or if I make R1 bigger, right, in this case, it's going to turn and give me the anti and not the sin, right? So it just, again, it just depends on the bulk of that substituent, right? And then you can see right here, this is after the, uh, after the reaction here and after the uh, silicon has been removed where well, you get back to here, right? So R, you can see the, the distance between R1 and R2 is much greater because of that newly formed sigma bond, right? So the steric interaction between those two is, is, all, is gonna be based on the size of R1 or R2. The bigger you make it, the more dramatic you'll see the numbers start to shift as far as the two diastereomers are concerned. All right, um, so let's talk about now another uh, way to induce chirality, and that is using organocatalysts, right? And I, and I say organocatalyst in, a, in quotes, because of some of the, most of the times, if you use an organocatalyst, it's more than likely going to be in a stoichiometric amount. It's not going to be in a catalytic amount, right? Catalytic amounts, you know, you want to say anywhere from 0.5 to 10, 10%. That's a good, efficient catalyst, right? That's a good amount, a good ratio of catalyst to um, starting materials. But... A lot of times with your organocatalysts, you have to use them in stoichiometric amounts. <laughs> so it's almost more like a reagent than it is a catalyst, but it does facilitate, it may still facilitate the reaction. Uh, so these organocatalysts are similar to your organometallic reagents. Uh, they emulate some of the properties, like uh, one of the main properties is that they can serve as uh, Lewis acids or Lewis basis, it just depends on which, what the purpose of the organocatalyst is. Uh, and there are four ways that they catalyze reactions or facilitate reactions, right? They can do nuclear, nucleophile, electrophile base activation. Like that's just normal standard Lewis acid, Lewis base uh, catalysis. Uh, you can make a reactive intermediate, which you know, a lot of times that's gonna end up being like an aminium ion or an enamine or something like that. But you can do phase transfer reactions, which we're not gonna talk about here, uh, but you can have these host gas complexes that go between the organic phase and whatever your second phase is. Or, or you can do molecular cavity uh, accelerated transformations. I had a, a um, that was a professor at Carolina when I was there, Dr. Uh, Gagne. 
he this is this was his specialty making molecular cavities so it's basically like a um you build this catalyst architecture and then it's like a, a receptor and host type thing right so you have a, a receptor and a binder not host so you have you build this catalyst architecture and that's that's your receptor and then it it selects between the substrates based on how well they fit into the cavity so uh maybe if we have time uh, in another lecture we'll talk about that because it's actually pretty fascinating chemistry so one of one of your one of the uh pioneers in this area of organocatalyzed reactions or using organic molecules to facilitate reactions is uh scott denmark and this is from uh, a paper that he submitted to a council of chemical research in 2000 uh, and he's he's using uh, phosphoramidate catalyst right and that's this that's this molecule over here so a phosphoramidate type catalyst um, and you can see the chirality right it's not it's not c2 symmetric because of the uh, the loss of symmetry here but you can see the chirality between these two phenyl groups right here right and so what he what he used this for is to catalyze the aldol reaction right and he used this cyclic uh enol ether right here just try uh trichlorosilane uh and cyclohexanone treat it with a base and then just trap it as the enol silo enol ether right and what he found out was that this particular reaction, the the stereochemistry was based on how many phosphoramidates coordinated to silicon. If you know anything about silicon, it actually can be hypervalent. It can be uh, tetracoordinate because it's in group four, but it also has like empty d orbitals on it. So it can actually go from tetracoordinate to pentacoordinate uh, to hexacoordinate. So you can put up to six things around silicon. It's actually a very good Lewis acid. Uh, so, and that's the organizing uh, functional group for this reaction, right? If, if uh, you add one phosphoramidate, that's the pathway. This is the pathway that this reaction follows, right? So the phosphoramidate uh, comes in and displaces one of your chlorines through the oxygen on phosphorus right here. So you displace a chlorine, and this is a, this is the intermediate that you get. And then you take this intermediate and react it with uh, benzaldehyde, right? And this is where the aldol the aldol reaction happens. But this is the proposed uh, transition state where you get this trigonal bipyramidal boat transition state. So this is where the reaction is happening. So here's your enol right here, right? Here's your aldehyde right here. And it's in a boat conformation. And the silicon itself is in a trigonal bipyramidal geometry, right? If y'all if y'all are in 513 right now or already have taken it, then you should, you should uh, remember the different uh, geometries like trigonal bipyramidal and octahedral or a uh, square planar or tetrahedral, so on and so forth, right? So the, the proposed transition state looks like this, all right? Where the silicon is organizing it, it's, it's actually organizing, uh, holding together or bonding the enolate, which is already bound to it, and then bonding the aldehyde, right? The aldehyde comes in and kicks off a second chlorine, right? All right, so so this boat transition state, trigonal bipyramidal silicon, and then this is the product, the sin product. So the sin product is a is a, a result of one phosphoramidate binding the silicon, and then from there forming this uh, trigonal bipyramidal boat, and then giving you the sin product. All right, and then the chlorine obviously can pop back onto silicon, kick off the phosphoramidate. And you can see here is, is trichlorosilane again. And then you basically you can start over, right? 
So you come back to here and then you, the phosphor amidate that got kicked off, you just re reuse it and do it, do that pathway again. Uh, and that's one of the, one of the things about another thing about organocatalysis is uh, a lot of times once you use whatever um, organocatalyst you select, once it's done, once it's used, once it's done with a catalyst or, or a metallic catalyst, it can go through multiple turnovers in a catalytic cycle. Like it's once, once it goes through the catalytic cycle, once it gets spit back out and it can go and do that again. You know, sometimes you can get a, a 10,000 turnovers, you can get a million turnovers, so on and so forth. Turnover is just how many times the catalyst goes through the cycle. Um, so, but an organo catalyst, it's, it's, it's kind of rare that it actually turns over and you can go back and, and start and use it again. Right, so that's one of the other part features of this reaction that made it special. Right, then then if you want to get the anti, right, the stoichiometry, you just change the stoichiometry. You so instead of starting with one phosphor amidate, so one to one ratio of phosphor amidate to uh, your enolate, you can add in two, and it changes everything. Right, so instead of displacing one chlorine from here, you actually displace. Uh, two chlorines, wait a minute. Let me make sure I'm, I'm good, so boom, so that's that. Never mind, never mind. You still displace one, my bad. But instead of it being trigonal by pyramidal, or here being tetrahedral, uh, instead of it being tetrahedral, now it's octahedral, right? So now you got six groups around silicon, right? Here in the transition state, here is is trigonal by pyramidal, right? So you got five groups around it. Then when you add in your aldehyde, you go from having five groups around silicon to it going hypervalent and being hexacoordinate, right? So you form an octahedron uh, transition state, octahedral transition state. And this, again, you can see it's like a chair. It's not a boat, right? And it's it's similar to that Zimmerman Traxton model, right? right, Where you have a, a chair-like transition state <clears throat> with silicon as the organizing element. So you go from trigonal by pyramidal here, uh, add your aldehyde in, and then you go from there to octahedral, just like you went here from tetrahedral to trigonal by pyramidal. Um, and this pathway using the two phosphoramidites gives you the antiproduct. So you can, and this, this is really high uh, stereo control, right? Uh, and you can use, again, the stoichiometry is gonna determine what the, uh, what the uh, which diastereomer predominates. If you use two phosphoramidates, you're gonna, the anti is gonna predominate. <clears throat> if you use one, then the sin is gonna predominate. <clears throat> and the number of phosphoramidates is gonna control what the transition state looks like. It's either going to be a chair or a boat, and it's either going to be octahedral or trigonal by pyramidal. So Denmark is like a, he's legendary uh, in, in this respect, and he's done some excellent work with these phosphoramidite type organocatalysts, right? Done excellent work and used them in different types of reactions as well. So um, another type of reaction Organocatalyzed reaction is, is uh, this proline catalyzed, uh, and you can see this is actually catalytic is 10% proline catalyzed um, aldol reaction, cross aldol, right? Normally you need a aldehyde and a ketone to do the aldol addition, but here you can do what's called a cross uh, aldol where you take two aldehydes and, and react them together. Right? And this is done by Macmillan, Dave Macmillan, and the only thing is one of your aldehydes needs to be able to be enolized, right? So that's why you have to extend that uh, carbon chain so you can actually make an enolate here, right? So this particular reaction, you take your two aldehydes and react them together, 10% pro L-proline and DMF at four degrees Celsius. And, you know, your R groups can vary 
That's why the time here is anywhere between 11 to 26 hours. But this is an anti or anti-selective uh, reaction, right? So normally you're gonna get the anti uh, diastereomer and you can see that the antio selection is off the charts, like 90, 91 to 99% EE. Uh, there's, I don't know of a reaction that's 100% EE. I don't think that's possible, but uh, I, there are definitely a lot of reactions that have that uh, display up to 99% in antio selection. So that's great. Uh, and the way you do this is uh, this group right here, the aldehyde you added in via syringe pump. So a lot of a lot of the um, reactions like this are based on the order of addition, right? So you have to make the enolate first, and then you syringe in your your uh, electrophile, your aldehyde, or whatever you're reacting it with. Uh, so that's why the note here says that it's done by syringe pump. So slow addition. Uh, if you notice, the temperature is not that low. It's on four degrees Celsius. It's not very uh, low temperature. And so how, one of the ways to combat uh, a loss of selectivity is to, uh, is to do slow addition, right? So you can take that aldehyde and add it in slowly with a syringe pump over a certain amount of time, and it kind of helps with the selectivity. Uh, but it's, it's, it's anti-selective, 24 to 1. Uh, up to three, three to one, up to twenty-four to one, and up to ninety-nine percent EE. Uh, so you look, if you look down here, this is the proposed mechanism. Now, and I have it written like kind of like a catalytic cycle because the proline is actually acting as a catalyst, right? It's only it's in ten percent, uh, ten more percent relative to uh, substrates. So the first thing is you you react the proline with. Uh, one of your aldehydes and you make an enamine, right? <clears throat> and so that enamine is here, right? It's a, well, this is not the enamine, this is the aminium. The enamine would have the pi bond here, right? And a sigma bond to nitrogen. I need to be able to annotate this. So the enamine would look like this. Let me see if I can draw it out. So that's my R group, and it sucks because I'm using my mouse. So you normally get an enamine when you uh, when you react a secondary amine. Right? When you react a secondary amine with a, a carbonyl. So the enamine looks like this. <laughs> and then this thing tautomerizes uh, to give you the aminium ion. Right, so it can it can tautomerize uh, with the acid. That's where your proton is going to come from. Right, so when this comes here. This pair of electrons is coming here onto this carbon, and it'll be an anion. But then you can pull off the man. I hate writing with this thing. You can pull off the carboxylic acid proton and have a proton on that carbon, right? So <clears throat> once you get to the aminium ion, right, and then now you can go back and forth between this and the Enamine, I did all this drawing and things right here. <laughs> but you, you go back and forth between this and the enamine, and it's the enamine that attacks your aldehyde, right? So it attacks the aldehyde as an electrophile. This is a, your nucleophile, this is your electrophile. So right here, in the aldol addition, the proline is chiral, right? And so with proline being this being a chiral center, that's going to control the approach of your aldehyde, and it's also going to dictate the outcome of the reaction, right? And obviously, it's very good at dictating out the stereochemical outcome because you get up to 99% EE, right? And you're, and you're also setting two stereo centers. You're setting this one and that one with only 10% proline as your catalyst. So that's, that's pretty amazing. 
Yep. So this is again, this was published by uh, Macmillan um, in the Journal of, of the American Chemical Society. And again, you get you get to set these two stereo centers and you get very, very good financial selection and good diastereo selection as well. Uh, but it's, but this particular reaction is anti-selective. So you're gonna get the anti-product as your favorite product. All right. And these are some other proline derivatives, right? Once, again, when you're talking about doing synthesis and method development, once a method is developed and published and it's, it works, and other people can duplicate it. Then what you go, what you start seeing after that uh, is people taking whatever you developed and developing analogous methods to it, right? So this is another example of using like a proline type derivative uh, to catalyze a reaction. And this is in two mole percent at minus twenty five, right? And so you have a acetone as your solvent, which also serves as your uh, ketone to make the enolate from it, and just uh, various aldehydes. And you get 99% EE and high yields with this. And this was done by Tang, published in Jackson 2005. All right, so, and you can see the chirality here. You also have chiral centers here. So it's kind of, mimic. it almost mimics the uh, diethyl tartrate ligand that we talked about with those epoxidations, with those two, uh, with the two ester groups here, all right? And then here's another organocatalytic reaction where you take uh, the dibenzyl acetal um, and TMS cyanide to do uh, cyanosilylation. So the cyanide acts as a, your nucleophile and then the silicon, you're able to trap the uh, oxyanion after you attack the uh, the carbonyl, right? So you can see the product over here. And this is a this stereo center set 92% EE and then 99% EO, which is excellent. Uh, and you need, and what you used here is this diamine ligand, 10 mole percent, and then uh, MCPBA as an oxidant. So MCPBA actually oxidizes these nitrogens to the N oxide, and that's how that ligand coordinates the silicon. And you can again see uh, silicon here as your organizing element. And then uh, your Lewis, it's gonna act as a Lewis acid. And then your substrate can bind to it with, with the long pairs that's on oxygen and organize that. And then the, the uh, cyanide nucleophile can just come in and attack. But <clears throat> the, the mode of attack, and whether it's from the top or bottom face on that uh, on that carbonyl is going to be determined by like this, the, the uh, cavity around it that's formed by this ligand, right? So that's why you see such high enantial selection. All right. So I think we'll stop here and then we'll pick this up on um, actually on Monday. So we don't have class. I just found out we don't have class Friday. So we'll pick it up on 